Building a Table for Seven is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. I'm Amber Lynn. I am a mother, I'm a wife, I'm a chef. I opened my restaurant business during the 2020 pandemic. I'm also a farmer. <laughs> I do remember my earliest hopes and dreams for a restaurant. I can actually even remember 2001 um, looking at my first restaurants. Um, and actually then I wasn't even growing food. So I had, I guess, already had a, a little bit of an affinity for something that was growing inside of me that I didn't really know yet, but could feel. Um, and I, actually it was a restaurant that I looked at in partnership with someone else. And it was here in Bemidji. But when I did look at the restaurant, I knew then that I didn't know what I was doing and that I wasn't ready to own a restaurant. Um, and then began my journey. Uh, and I didn't know, I think until maybe 10 years into my journey, exactly what my hopes and dreams were for it um, and how it would operate. So um, I knew that I wanted farm to table and I knew that um, you know, I, I wanted it to be unique and different, but yet still feel very, um, very much like you know, a home kitchen where you're very welcome, where you know, the food is home cooked um, from scratch. Uh, and I guess those are my earliest hopes and dreams. Farm to Table is um, where you're trying to give your money um, your, your resources to uh, farmers within a hundred mile radius actually is the definition. So you're giving your money directly to that farmer to get their beef or to get their vegetables and bring it into the restaurant and then sharing it with other people and, and cooking from scratch. So in my farm to table restaurant, the menu is really dictated by what we have available, the seasons, who's farming, who's farming what, you know, when we run out of something, we, we have to move on. And that's, that's what makes our menu really different than a lot of other places. And we just really like pride ourselves on, you know, zero waste, using what we have. And we really want to make sure that we're not being wasteful. We're being responsible with whatever we have foraged or whatever farmers have grown because it's a lot of work and nature does a lot of work. Um, and we should be really thankful for what we, what we have available. I brought Farm to Table to Bemidji because I am a Bemidji native. I grew up here and when I moved back to Bemidji after having my first child, I did invest in a farm that was in my family. Um, it was owned by my great aunt. Um, it was a place that I grew up being at, so there was a lot of nostalgia. Throughout the years of having kids and jobs and other things, there's just, there's no way that I could move. <laughs> I love where I live. I love my farm. Uprooting five kids just for, you know, a restaurant dream um, would be hard for them, and I respect that. This farm was owned by my great aunt. Um, who was actually my grandma's sister on my mom's side. <clears throat> actually, my grandma was one of my, my big influencers. She was a baker and she spent very little on groceries and they grew their own corn and tomatoes and cucumbers and potatoes, you know, and onions, you know, like the things that are pretty common. But she would always make something delicious out of nothing. I felt like her food was always really, really good. So she's one of my inspirations. But here on my great aunt's farm, I grew up here as a little girl. We would butcher chickens. They ran beef cattle for a number of years and then had another farmer running beef cattle here. Um, and then the garden. So when I first moved here, there was an original garden that had been here throughout my childhood. And I thought about turning it into yard because I wasn't a gardener at that point in time. I thought the more I thought about it and like tried to psych myself into turning it into just yard, I couldn't do it. <laughs> So I started gardening and that's where it began. <laughs> Let's see, I got interested in farming because, uh, well, first of all, I have a degree in food service and nutrition. So I was kind of interested in the nutrition part of food. 
just it kind of grew from there. It was really exciting to grow your own food and to have the difference of taste. Food grown locally tastes so much better and it's so much more nutritious for you. You know, I worked in the restaurant industry, so I already liked food. I like to eat food. <laughs> um, and then it became such a labor of love that I couldn't, you know, I wanted to feed people with it and I wanted to, you know, it just, it just kept growing and growing and growing. So I think uh, farming is kind of a disease. <laughs> well, once you start, um, and if you really do enjoy it, it's kind of the people who enjoy it um, can't stop. Um, some of us will weed for all day, and it's okay, and we, we enjoy it. It's kind of a it's kind of zen. <laughs> and then there are others that um, you know don't don't like it. But if you have the farming disease, then then you find yourself here. This is kind of was my day today, is just the potatoes. So I actually have to go to my real job after this. What's your day job? I'm um, actually a chef, to, chef de cuisine at Concordia Language Villages, running the Spanish and French programming there. Yeah, I've been there for three years. Their structure changed just three years ago, so they offered full-time positions, and it's kind of cool. It's been nice to learn ethnic cuisine. It's, it's a kind of a gem in northern Minnesota that um, that's pretty cool. Yep, our potatoes are, we put everything in by hand. Um, the farm that we get them from is organic. Um, so we know that they've been, they're free of pesticides and herbicides and things that are not healthy for you. And um, we also have several different varieties. So we have some Adirondack reds, some Adirondack blues. Um, that are blue and red on the inside and contain some, you know, colorful antioxidants. And uh, they're tasty. I have uh, five children, <laughs> ranging from uh, 16 to 2. <laughs> so um, that's, that's kind of a wide range of kids. <laughs> Uh, I remember doing a lot of uh, daydreaming around the table with my kids. So that was one thing that, you know, we'd sit around at night sometimes and, and daydream about what the menu might look like. So like, you know, a farm BLT with a fried egg on it. And, you know, just some of the things that I would cook up at home and then writing those recipes down. I have a number of books that have a lot of written recipes in them. So I knew that I wasn't going to have a menu that was one set thing. And that was probably the most unsure thing. Um, and I was unsure that Bemidji would be okay with that because most menus are set or at least set for, you know, a season or, you know, a certain number of months. But I knew that my menu really had to revolve around what we had available because that would be what was best and that's what I wanted. It's exciting to me. Boy, the earth likes to give you rocks every year. There are many rock piles on this farm. <laughs> <laughs> Old farms always have rock piles along all of the woods edges and things like that. And I think being a farmer, I think it helps me as a chef connect with farmers more. Um, and it kind of, you know, happened backwards. I was a farmer before, before a chef. Um, but the farmers trust me. They think of me as one of their own, not just a chef. So we have that camaraderie and it took about 10 years to build that camaraderie or those relationships and get them to trust me so that, you know, they come to me and say, hey, I have, you know, 20 pounds of this and 30 pounds of tomatoes. And what do you, what do you think in this week? They're really, a lot of them are really great about that and making sure that I get in first <laughs> when the, when the bison steaks come in. <laughs> uh, so that is huge for me to be able to have that network. I think the biggest thing is uh, that people kind of wonder about your history and who, who are you and you know, what, what are, you know, do, do you really know anything about food? And so I've had a lot of questions about who I am and what, what I've done and do you know farmers in the area and whatnot. So farming, I've been farming since 2003, but only doing it as a job or side job since um, 2012. So for about seven years. Um, so I've known farmers in the area for um, quite a while, you know, eight years, um, probably a little bit longer. I, uh, so it's, I, I have good relationships with a lot of them and 
I hope that they're excited too. <laughs> Well, it's not a restaurant that Bemidji has had, so that makes me a little bit different. And I do think it's great that I can introduce Bemidji to something different. You know, I know we have some ethnic cuisine, we have a few different restaurants, but we have a lot of bar and grills and a lot of fast food. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's nice introducing people to different things. So to fresher food, you know, introducing people to farmers, introducing people to vegetables cooked in ways that they have not had before, introducing people to vegetables that they haven't heard of. It's fun for me in that aspect um, because I think that one of my challenges, my personal challenges, is to get people to like vegetables and food that they wouldn't otherwise think that they would like. So just kind of, you know, reinventing what your palate is or what you like or don't. It just, maybe you just didn't have it prepared the right way. So I have five children and as we all know it's hard to uh, get children to eat their vegetables. Over the years I have learned that uh, fresh vegetables that are homegrown, close to your house, that aren't shipped from very far away are much more palatable for children. <laughs> uh, they're much sweeter, they're much tastier, they're much more nutritious. Um, and actually for, for everyone, um, my kids have a hard time eating vegetables out of the store. Uh, just because like that tomato in the store does not taste as yummy and sweet as that tomato um, out of your farmer's you know garden or your own garden. Um, here we've got potatoes that have cut you know so that their eyes are separated you know each each little potato portion has an eye on it that will become the plant. Actually dude this is a really good potato year. <laughs> So growing potatoes and just about any vegetable, um, for example, it should have been a great year for squash, but for me it wasn't. I don't know what happened. Sometimes you plant those seeds, whether they're potatoes or squash or corn, and um, nature takes over. So you have high hopes that you're gonna have a great yield and that you're going to have healthy plants and you're gonna have a good germination and you know you just kind of leave it to nature after that and do what you can with watering but you uh, especially organically um, try to pick the bugs off of the potato plants every day <laughs> uh, but you you kind of you're at the mercy of nature at that point there were a lot of tasks that needed to be completed to open a restaurant and um, those were basically learning everything that i would be doing in my restaurants. So whether it was managing a kitchen, baking, serving, cooking, line cooking, batch cooking, like there was just a lot to learn. And I wanted to make sure that I knew how to do numbers, write a business plan, do payroll, programming, right? We program our POS and our website and uh, do all that fun stuff. So there was a lot, but I needed to learn all those things in order to be successful. The tasks were pretty endless, but I think I made it all the way around. And my husband asked me, why do you have to know how to do everything? Because when you don't you know, you have to wash dishes and you do this. You know what I mean? Like, he's like, why would you learn everything? Cause then you end up doing it. And I say, well, that's, then I know what it is. And I know yes, how to fill in that gap. And I know what it entails. And I can show my people that I know their job and I know how they feel in their job. You know, it, it brings me to their level. And I want to be on the same level with them as a chef. I don't want to be way up here. <laughs> we got third course in waiting. I don't know, I don't remember what the course is. <laughs> Uh, the menu is up on the board over there. First course is the cheese plate, second course is the salad, third course is the soup, fourth course is the flank steak, and the last course I'm working on right now. Is it 5.30 yet? Not yet. How, how long ago 5.30? Yeah, 20 minutes. Okay. Doing the pop-up restaurant, I learned uh, some of my limits because um, we would need to get in there at three o'clock, um, sometimes 2.30, and we need to have the first of five courses out the door by 6.30. And you know, with that comes unpacking, right? It's not that we're coming there and we've got a fully stocked kitchen and we've got you know, everything we need. We had to unpack everything, <laughs> get everything you know, situated, mise en place, and then begin cooking. So there was a little bit of figuring out like <clears throat> what our limits were, or my limits were actually, I exceeded my limit, I think. <laughs> It's because they're from cows that aren't all fed the same. That aren't born in a bowl. Yeah. 
That's real life right there. <laughs> the flank steak for tonight's, uh, all the flanks are different sizes. You know, commercially, generally, the, the flanks are similar sizes and, and look about the same, whereas you have more variety when it's coming off of, uh, you know, perhaps a couple of different farms, but certainly, you know, they're, they're not fed the same as commercial cows. <laughs> This is where the kitchen breaks out and dance. <laughs> the pop-ups also were a challenge for myself. Like, was, was my food good enough? Not only for me, but for others. I don't want to go and open a mediocre restaurant, and which is really, like, it's a challenge to keep your staff trained to introduce new dishes and I mean we're doing that every week sometimes and it's a lot of work to keep that quality up make sure customers are happy make sure they they like your food I mean that was essentially like am I gonna be good enough to open and make it <laughs> no no blend first okay. quick blend don't don't finally puree it and uh, you know it can be it can be a little chunky, right? We, we don't because otherwise it's gonna be too hard for you to strain. Right. And then um, heat it up, and then we'll strain it. So the pop-up restaurant was not not necessarily my idea. I'm gonna give my credit to Tate McAllen, who um, I uh, have done a dinner with, and he's a Bemidji um, local. Does not live here right now, but he did a pop-up right before I did mine. Uh, and he did it at Minnesota Nice Cafe. And I thought, wow, that is a really cool idea. I knew that they were doing it in bigger cities like Minneapolis or you know, in, in California, wherever, other bigger cities. But I had never thought about doing one here in Bemidji or it never had crossed my mind that there might be a venue available for that. So um, that was kind of the big deal. It's like, where, where do you ask when they know that you're um, a budding chef, maybe wanting your own business? How do you just approach a restaurant, go in and be like, hey, can I borrow your restaurant for a day so you don't make any money? <laughs> I can cook my food and introduce this to the community. Um, and luckily my husband, he said, well, what about the Sanford Center? And I was like, Sanford Center, hmm, yeah, okay, okay. That, I mean, there's not a real, they do catering, they do their own things, but not a real restaurant competition. And I cold called the Sanford Center and they, they told me that I was a little crazy at first. You know, they're like, that's a really crazy idea. And so I, I obliged that and I said, I understand, you know, you got a really, I'm sure you got a really nice kitchen, really expensive. You have no idea who I am. And that's, that's cool. They, you know, thanks for at least entertaining my idea. And um, actually they called me back a few days later and they wanted to know more and they wanted me to come see their kitchen. So um, yeah, it was the director at the time and then the chef that was in that kitchen, they were interested in it and willing to, I don't know, just willing to entertain the idea. And eventually they said yes and we had a contract and I did one a month during the summer of 2019. And I found that Bemidji was um, really okay and happy with being served a menu that wasn't solidified until the day of the dinner and they were okay with eating what they were served rather than choosing off of a menu. Um, some of them said that they really enjoyed just kind of being able to relax and not make any decisions and just kind of like waiting for the food to come out and just the excitement of it. So then I knew that the kind of menu that I wanted to make and changing frequently was going to work out. So the pop-up restaurant nights, what we call them, they were pre-pandemic. So that was 2019. And actually, I had a lot of support from my family, support from people that I knew in the community, you know, just kind of sharing the idea. A lot of support from my fellow colleagues who helped me without pay. <laughs> Honestly, like we broke, we broke even. We were able to pay our bill with Sanford. It was exciting. It was a learning opportunity. It was them helping me with you know, the frontier of what I wanted to do. My family served at them. One of my friends was like the head front house. She would decorate all the tables. But we did five of those in 2019. And I remember the last one, um, I had people in the audience saying, can't we do another one next month? <laughs> and I said, no, 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 this is it for the year. We're gonna get dinner started. We've got uh, the first course coming out. My name is Amber Lynn and welcome.
thank you. This is amazing. <laughs> I'm really good at Terry. <laughs> I'm actually going to borrow this. We have an incredible meal for you tonight. Um, everybody's worked hard. And thank you. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the meal um, and just kind of go through everything. And then we're just going to let you have a good time and, um, and eat and enjoy yourselves. Um, first of all, our first course coming out is jam um, with strawberry and jalapeno. The jam has a little bit of a kick, so know that going into it. You have blue cheese from the caves of Faribault, Minnesota. And you have a turkey wheat sourdough um, with a little bit of bran in it. Our second course, they were excited and that was exciting to me. And I, um, I had been looking for a place for quite some time. And it really made me look harder to find something. <laughs> that I could settle into. So Bemidji really solidified the fact that I needed a brick and mortar restaurant and I began to look harder. So looking for a brick and mortar place in Bemidji to have a restaurant, um, was a big challenge. Uh, I think I started in 2017 um, and it's do I buy, do I build, do I rent, um, what does that cost, you know, where location, you know, all those things go into play. Um, and it, it is really a challenge for sure. You're looking at buying an exist existing, you know, restaurant that it's for sale. And are you gonna, you know, overcome the cha same challenges that they might have had? Is it location? You know, there's just a lot with choosing a spot that I think that's the hardest thing that's been for me in owning a restaurant is location. So when I walked into the place that we're currently in, what saying to me was the kitchen. It was like, oh, the kitchen is big enough to handle raw produce, you know, the kind of meat things that we do baking, where a lot of line kitchens are really small and sometimes, you know, really skinny with a small prep area. But we are heavy prep. We spend a whole, actually two whole days on prep every week besides the prep in between. But to turn a brand new dish up and running or deal with, you know, carrots with full on tops and we use those tops, um, you know, dealing with lettuce that we have to wash or whatever it might be, we just, we're, we're prep heavy. So um, these guys, uh, like I said, we're working on rendering lard um, because David needs to use lard for his uh, Cuban bread because um, he we're gonna do the Cuban sandwich that he wants to do. So he's working on that. Um, and then he we're gonna do our own fruit syrups for soda instead of having, actually that cooler over there needs to get picked up. Uh, and that'll be really exciting to use local fruit for that. Well, we actually worked on, um, there was a piece of the bar that was dropped down, so we actually took that off and moved it up, and now we need to take some, um, some uh, I don't know what it's called, bar epoxy, and then kind of flood the rest so it, it's, it's all even, um, so we have a nice bar. Uh, we switched out some lighting, we got some wallpaper down, we're gonna have local art in here, so uh, eventually when people can come in, um, we'll, we'll have some local art. It was a shock. The pandemic was happening. I, I'm not a very good news watcher, number one. Um, so when the, it came out, you know, that suddenly it was this scary thing, right? And the country shutting down. And actually I had just quit my long-term care job. Um, and I think we touched on it at one of, our, one of our meetings just briefly before I left. And I was like, what, what is that? You know what I mean? But, but not being a big newsy person, um, I didn't really know what was going on. So when that hit, it was a shock and it really had me back on my heels reconsidering opening. Um, like I said, we're considering maybe setting up as a market instead of a restaurant. You know, if we can do carry out and we can have people um, come in and buy things that are, you know, when there's just, I don't know, 10 people in here. Um, or less, then that's kind of a consideration. We might move out all the tables and chairs and whatnot. So um, we'll have to see how that goes. And it really made me kind of sad. Like I, I had a really heavy heart and I, I, I didn't know what the right choice was at that time. So I went with my gut. <laughs> and my gut just said, push forward. 
push forward. You're going to figure it out just like every other challenge that you've had to figure out in your life. And I've had a few of them because um, that's, that's how we, we, that's what we do with challenges, right? We don't, when challenges come or hard times come, we just, we have to work through it. And so that's what I did. And I pushed forward and opened in not a way that I had expected um, with a different menu that I had uh, not expected either um, and just tried to navigate my way through it. Uh, well, at first I felt a little bit uneasy and, and not sure, um, but as time has gone on, I just realized that, you know, we just, we need to get through this and we need to be innovative and positive and just do what we can. Um, it's been my dream forever, so to quit now would be really, really hard. An entrepreneur pivots. That's the, the key word, pivot. <laughs> and you have to do what you have to do to make it. Um, because if you don't, you're not gonna make it. So I pivoted. Uh, I did some things that were a little bit fancier that would make it in a box to your house if you took takeout. Um, and then I did a lot of sandwich and fry things, which I wasn't very happy about the fries. Um, we, we do cut our own cut fries when, when we can. Um, but yeah, that's what got me through is just doing takeout and just tweaking my menu so it was more takeout friendly. And it wasn't exactly what I wanted to do, but I felt like if I didn't do that, then I, I wouldn't survive. So we were in the pandemic, you, we, indoor dining wasn't open. So I'm a little bit like rustic fine dining. And so how was I gonna put that in a box? I'm working on, we foraged some ramps and I'm working on making ramp pesto. Uh, and then we're gonna turn that, some of that into ramp pesto butter. Um, and freeze for later for use with steak. So yeah, that's what we're working on. And Casey is um, seasoning a mortar and pestle. You have to season them before you use them initially because you have to. <laughs> they need rice and garlic and, and spices and whatnot to create a barrier in there for that mortar and pestle. So like I said, we had foraged some ramps here. So I'm gonna be um, turning these into ramp pesto we cut off the bottom um, part of the leek to be able to roast it for pizza. So we did that yesterday. So these are just the leaves um, and the leaves work really nicely for making pesto. They have a lot of good flavor. So, and when we are done, it looks like this, very bright green and very tasty. So some of what we, and we'll use that for pasta. We we'll use that for pizza sauce. Um, really good pizza sauce um, and making ramp pesto butter for steak. Having a menu with foraged items during the pandemic, it was nice to introduce people to things. I just had to be really careful what I introduced. I think that was really key during the pandemic to begin with because if it was too out there, then they probably weren't going to order it. Do you know what I mean? I hadn't had enough of a reputation where they would be more adventurous. So, you know, when we did charcuterie boards, we put up pickled um, fiddlehead, you know, in the charcuterie board. So you weren't necessarily ordering the pickled fiddlehead, but it came with your charcuterie board, which sounds way more palatable. You know, introducing ramp pesto, which is absolutely delicious. Things like that. Things that we, you know, we can identify as familiar um, that people would want to order. Yeah, and I'm not seeing any. Any fiddleheads at all that are, they're all gone. Oh, such pretty. There's a lot of little tiny ones. Like, like really? The oh yeah, here's one. I did find some, so this is really tightly curled and you can kind of see, uh, yeah, this would be the last edible um, fiddlehead. You can see the, the fronds are starting to come out. So it's loosening up before it comes out. out. And so I wouldn't pickle this one, but I would, Fry it and eat it for sure. It's a very cool thing. And it's, like I said, it brings me really close to the earth and it makes me just feel, um, I feel really blessed to have that food available. And I, I feel fortunate and, and I feel close, close to the earth. And I, it's a special feeling for sure. Well, it kind of seems like this is the spot. So uh, what I do is I look for the biggest leaves 
And then I also, I kind of go down the stalk and see how thick the stalk is. So like, here's some good ones over here. All right, so there's just three on this one coming out right now. So I would just pick one and that would be it. So when we're harvesting, we take a look at the plant and we want to leave at least two of the fiddleheads on there so that the plant can live and can reproduce and still be there for us next year. So that's really important. So we leave two to three per, per plant. There's plenty out here. Oh, here, yeah, here's some that's, this one's still in its crown. I'm just going to tie these guys on here because I don't want them to get dirty because yeah, sure. we don't want any dirt on them. So I'm just going to tie it. It'll be okay. Yeah. So foraging for wild ramps uh, and fiddleheads <laughs> is um, a really special thing. So I actually think any foraging is really special. And those of us who do forage or the good majority of us who do forage, we want to make sure we do so responsibly and we want to make sure that we leave the foraging areas that we use in good health is the biggest thing so so yeah it's harder to clean the fiddleheads dirt from the inside there so we just want to make sure we brush the paper off of them and, and they're mostly clean and we don't want anybody eating a gritty fiddlehead <laughs> oh it smells so good out here it does it smells like garlic out here. oh it's so great it makes you hungry but yeah, he's got some nice, oh, those are nice size ones. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. So those are nice size bulbs on there. So that would be something good for pickling. So we pickle yeah. that bottom part. So you can see where they're, where you have to cut them off. They're still attached. They get way down there. Normally we try to take some out of a, a patch. Like there's a couple ways, like he's gonna dig down. It's actually, like I said, stuck to like a rhizome and you have to actually cut it off. It's a little bit like a green onion, but it's still stuck down there. So we don't wanna take the whole plant, but we take some. And as long as you're not going to throw away the bottom parts and you're going to use the leaves and the white parts, I would take it. But if you're just going to want to make pesto or something, you just take the tops. Such a beautiful coexistence. <laughs> yeah, this is pretty amazing that someone shared with me this spot. <laughs> yeah, this was just as thick last year. Just as thick, only I didn't make it here for the fiddleheads because I came on the 17th of May, and the fiddleheads were already out, and what, today is the 18th of May? We came on the 11th, and it was perfect timing. So that tracks, even though the weather seems different last year, I'm sure the spring was different, it, there, it's spot on, exactly, it's kind of crazy. So the value that comes from this foraging is that I don't have to necessarily pay for this product and it probably would cost us about $400 to buy this product from somebody else. <laughs> so and it's no different than, you know, if I'm buying direct from a farmer, then I'm cutting out the middleman. Uh, it's my time and actually it's my health. I'm out in mother nature. So that's really important. It's a different thing. It's a neat thing. And it makes me feel more connected to you know, the, our surroundings here in northern Minnesota. It's, it's important, plus it, I mean, it's just kind of, it's what we do. It's something that is grown. I mean, it's not farmed except by, the, by Mother Nature. Um, and it's something we can add to our menu that's special, so. When did you decide that you wanted to forage? Um, well, I, I actually kicked around uh, something in my yard for about five years before um, I decided to take a mushroom class and it, it was a mushroom, but it was a big, I thought it was a big ugly mushroom and I, I thought, why is this thing growing in my yard every year and I would kick it around. Um, and when I started get interesting, getting interested in foraging, um, I decided to take a mushroom class and I learned that that was a hen of the woods mushroom that was growing in my yard and that I was kicking around for the last five years. And just kind of foraging goes along with farming. You know, you're out in the woods, we have a, a large property. I go on walks back there, we do as a family. 
you know, you find certain things. There's just a lot that nature has to offer us. So it just kind of went hand in hand with, with farming, I guess, and owning a piece of property that contained things that were able to be foraged. So we're gonna take these leaves and we're gonna um, clean them up and then we are gonna make pesto out of them. Makes a nice garlicky, uh, bright green sauce. Actually, the sauce is brighter green than even these leaves. And then we're gonna um, spread that onto our sourdough uh, pizza crust and top it with cheese and some, some of the ramps roasted from the bottom and have a, a ramp pesto pizza. So we've got our very own sourdough starter that we are gonna be using to make pizza dough with. So we take the discard. So normally you feed your sourdough, you discard that. We're gonna take the discard and make pizza dough with it, which is actually really tasty. So, and all of this has lovely wild yeast in it, no conventional yeast, and it's kind of a fun beast. This one hasn't been out and, and working for very long. We just fed it yesterday. So um, it'll raise up to almost the, the top. So, and then we'll probably make it bigger as we get going, it'll need a bigger container. And that takes a while to get going. So now that's going and um, that's really, really fun. So we can do lots of things with that. Um, when we harvest mushrooms, I make sure I always take the remnants after after we process them, clean them and whatever, take them out in a basket and spread them back in the woods. <laughs> for sure. Actually, I hope I get more mushrooms this year just for doing that. Got a little white part there, I'm gonna pull that off. Yeah, I don't wanna shove this whole, the whole leaf in the food processor. It'll probably get gummed up in there, so. We want to make sure we chop them up a little bit anyway. Like I said, we, we chose this kitchen because it was bigger. <laughs> I, had, I wouldn't have rented it if, uh, if it didn't have this big of a kitchen because when you're dealing with whole, whole ingredients all the time, you need a lot of space. Put all these beautiful things in here. And then we're going to put some cheese in there, some good Parmesan. Good ingredients is important. break it up a little bit. All right, that's actually plenty. We're gonna add about a quarter cup of pine nuts. And we need some olive oil. So these have a garlic flavor to them. You could add extra garlic, but I like it just the way it is. So we don't need to doctor it at all. Um, salt is the only other thing that we need for this. It's pretty simple, pretty amazing. Add a little bit more of the leaves. All right, a little bit of salt. And more oil. There we go, now it's coming together. Good food, it can be really simple and delicious and we have a lot of uh, things to choose from around the area from different farms so um, and also wild crafting I mean that is a big thing so a lot of people are foraging mushrooms or ramps or fiddleheads um, it's become a it's become a big thing so I think you can eat cattails I, I never have from top to bottom so that's something else but it's always fun to try new things but we just we have a lot more um, diversity here than people think so and I hope we can showcase that throughout the next year <laughs> maybe you give it one more all right and whatever we don't use up um, right away we're gonna go ahead and put in little cups and freeze so that we can use it um, I actually last year used the stuff that I made all through the winter so we're wondering how much freezer space we're gonna need because <laughs> because uh, it will be canning and freezing and things like that. But um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how much space we need. You know, whether we can retail it or whether it's gonna go in, a, in the food, those are decisions we'll have to make, you know, just as we go. So, well, we have to bring our processing stuff. We have processing equipment, but this is kind of a big, big production kitchen. You know, there's a lot going on. We need a lot of equipment for processing and canning for freezing, just taking on whole things. 
So yeah, we'll have to see. And when you're trying to cook and process stuff at the same time, it can be really busy. Yeah, I just talked to a farmer this morning who thinks she can get me some early peas. <laughs> I was, I was excited about that and actually she was going to take a look at squash too because a lot of farmers will hold over their squash in, in a cold area for the winter and she said she may have some that's still good so. Yeah I had a much bigger team. I have a much bigger team but I can, can only uh, take on so many of them right now until we figure out how many right, how many people we actually need and how busy we're going to be. So. We've got David and Casey in here, and I've been working with David for, gosh, uh, I think four years, almost four years now, um, and Casey just a year. So, um, and then I have another guy, Andrew, who is kind of my main guy who I've been working with for five years, but yeah, um, he is actually, he might be helping us this summer if we're busier, but he was going to be moving to Minneapolis. <laughs> so we'll see. I have a feeling he may come back up here and camp in my backyard and uh, and help us out. So Put some oil on there right away. All right, I'm just going to take a look at what's. This rendering fat over here, it's all ground up. So it's very cool to have a restaurant in downtown Bemidji. I think now that I've been in downtown Bemidji, it's kind of, I got I have a little bit of a thing for being downtown. When we were uh, trying out some of our things, you know, new items or, um, we actually would run across the street to Wasabi and share with them. Right, walking across to Wasabi. Go give them some ramp pizza. Or we'd run down the street to another business and we would share, you know, our pesto pizza, ramp pesto pizza, or I think we also shared some steak with ramp pesto butter. So it, it's really fun to have other food places that we can share with. And um, I don't know, I just, I, I love, being downtown, it's really, really awesome. And I think there should be more food places downtown, honestly. <laughs> so uh, I quit my full-time job, which was in long-term care, but I also, <laughs> I do things crazy sometimes. I think it was uh, the fall before. So summer of 2019, in the end, I think it was August, uh, I was driving by the, the school district bus garage and I saw their sign out looking for school bus drivers. Are you sure you don't want to go play in your sandbox? No. He says he doesn't want to go play in his sandbox. He'd rather come and gather with me. <laughs> he does it right until the end. Are you going to pick tomatoes? I said to my kids, you know, I think I'm going to learn how to be a school bus driver. I mean, why not? I can drive a truck and trailer. I can haul a cow or a horse. And so bus driving can't be that much worse. <laughs> so the kids were like, you're crazy, mom. Why are you doing this? They were a little bit embarrassed that mom was going to learn how to be a school bus driver. Um, but I did it. And I actually, in my brain, it was a little bit like, well, you know, I could drive in the morning you know, in between like quitting my full-time job and drive in the evening or afternoon. And in between I could set up my restaurant. So, you know, and then I could make it through the school year and then be done. So that's what I did. I learned how to be a school bus driver. And then when the pandemic hit, um, and even when my restaurant opened, I continued to drive bus the next year. So in 20, um, tw the fall of 2020 and 2021, I continued to drive bus. Um, in order to pay my own bills. <laughs> I, I don't know what it is. I've learned through life and like listening to like the whispers and, and maybe people don't feel the same way as I do about it, but you know, there's red flags, right? We all know what red, we know what red flags are, but there's also whispers and you, I've learned to pay attention to them. So that was like a whisper, like, hey, you should do this. And it was really strange to me, but I, I've learned to go with it. 
So it's like I almost knew that I was going to need that. Um, you were going to need us. I was going to need, no, I was going to need another job to, to make, for some reason, right? I didn't need it. I was planning on opening quickly enough where it wasn't a big deal. And I didn't know pandemic was going to hit, but thank goodness I listened and I had that job that carried me through the pandemic. Um, because if I didn't have something that would have worked um, with the hours, I don't think I I would have, I mean, personally, I wouldn't have made it, so. So, because of the pop-ups, events that people can sign up for are kind of sure things. Um, also, we love doing events because events are, we know exactly what we're doing. We are creating food for that one event. We know exactly how much food we're creating. We're not wasting anything. And people come and they just, they have a great time and it's actually really great for us. We, we love that. And it's, it gives us the opportunity to do something outside of the box. So when we have an event, we have people sign up ahead of time. Um, one of the events we did was tapas this summer. And yeah, people sign up ahead. We know exactly what we're creating. Um, we put a menu out ahead of time and uh, you can choose to be there and relax and have a, have a great time. So tapas are small plates um, that are Spanish dishes. So it's, it's a thing in Spain. It's just a small plate generally shared amongst people. I like Spanish food, I like Spanish cooking. So every once in a while we'll do an event. Sometimes I'll do a guest chef. Um, Tate McAllen was actually one of them. Uh, I mentioned him earlier. Um, and we did a collaboration dinner. I'm hoping to have another guest chef this fall working on it. I'm really excited about it. And then we, we do things like Women in Wine and uh, we've done things with BSO, but I wanted kind of a different kind of ethnic standalone. And so we tried out tapas for one night, did a dinner, two seatings, people loved it. And so actually then we did it for a whole week and it went so well that week. I was actually expecting it to not be busy at all. I was expecting it to be pretty dead. People, you know, wondering what in the world are we doing? Or, you know, what is this? Uh, it went so well, we did it for two weeks. So I was really excited about that. That's kind of the fun about owning my own restaurant and not being able to do what I want, that I can do stuff like that. And it's, it's fun for the community. <laughs> Yeah, the restaurant industry changed a lot during the pandemic. I think people felt that it wasn't a very stable job because, you know, we weren't doing indoor dining. A lot of people got laid off. You know, restaurant people are known for being worked long hours. So going from, you know, working a lot, having a steady income to not being able to work at all or very little or maybe not having a job, um, that was kind of a shock. So a lot of people, then use it as their opportunity to get out of the restaurant industry. So I feel like the pool of people, like I know people who have left because of the pandemic and not, not because of, but as a, as a product of, I guess. You know, they just saw it as their opportunity to go to online school or, you know, go for that other job. And a lot of jobs have gone online. So that's been a big change. Um, also, you know, the ones that reopened, I suppose, in the pandemic, um, some of them were worked many, many hours too. And everybody just started to value their lives in a different way, or they had time to evaluate, you know, their life and their work life. Um, now people need to be paid better. I mean, it's not easy. It's not easy work. People need to also live their lives. So like my staff, I've never denied a person a day off since the day I employed someone, <laughs> never. So we all rally around each other. We all, we all work it out. You know, we, we want, I want people to have the time that they need to take or the hours, you know, I have set schedules. Um, my servers have a little bit of a hard time getting used to that because they're used to people saying, oh, well, your schedule's not out till, you know, whenever, and you just kind of, they fill you in. But my people are put in set hours, and I, I do try to employ people that I can employ for the hours that they want. I think staffing really changed during the pandemic also in that people are looking for a job that is really gonna feed them 
you know, education, feed them, you know, feed their soul. I think that's kind of a big topic right now. Like you just don't want that job that you go to that grinds you and, you know, ne neither do I as a business owner. <laughs> so yeah, we all get two days off a week. Um, and I treat my staff like family. So we, we call it our kitchen family and that, that is actually a thing. Um, but we do outings together, um, adventures together, tubing, cookouts. Um, they can come out to the farm anytime that they want. They have other farms that they can come out to anytime that they want. We really do value them a lot and just try to treat them really well and um, make it a really good work environment. So I think that that's another thing in kitchens that sometimes they're known for their negative environments and our kitchen environment is really positive and we really support each other. Oh, that's not, nope, that's, we want them to see that. In. So you're gonna give them about, a, you can see where my mark is. Yeah, it's a, it's a different environment to get to get used to. I know a couple of cooks where they're used to like getting yelled at by the chef or, or the business owner. And I'm like, I'm like, you have to be pretty bad for me to yell at you. <laughs> I said, you have to do something pretty awful. I think we just really need to, to value each other more. And, um, you know, they're human beings too. I don't know that I feel a change in customer service other than we're serving a couple of different groups of customers. So, you know, we still have the people who are, don't want to go out to eat, right? Or they come out to eat when that people aren't so much in the restaurant or, you know, we still have people coming in with masks, which is totally fine. Um, we have people who only want to take out and we're still doing online ordering and take out. And that's actually something I would have never started if it hadn't been for the pandemic. I, I would have never started with take out um, a, a website, online ordering, all that stuff, I, I wouldn't have done it. Um, for a while we did delivery and people really did enjoy that, but I think it's taken people a while to like come back out, to do their thing, to get in the habit of going out again. Yeah, it's just kind of, it's, it's just taken a long time. There's still no rhyme or rhythm or reason or, it's still different, <laughs> for sure. Well, I roll around a lot of names in naming my restaurant. Um, you know, the Red Rooster, the, the Red Barn, you know what I mean? There's just a lot of around the farm things. And then I kind of decided that I wanted to, uh, the feel that I wanted to bring to my restaurant was more like, hey, you're coming to my house to have a meal. And then I thought, okay, you're coming to my house. So my house is... Okay, my family, my seven people who have been great supporters, right? My, my kids have worked at the pop-up dinners. My husband has, uh, you know, he, and he's, he's very much an introvert and, you know, still was the ticket taker. But he, uh, they, they've all been great supporters. And my oldest son said to me, <clears throat> Mom, you're never going to open that restaurant before I graduate. And he graduated in May of 2020 and I opened in May of 2020. So I settled on the name Table for Seven to just pay tribute to my family and just let people know that that is a big part of my success. So I have seven people in my family and it's Table for Seven. You can bring a table for two or a table for ten, whatever you want. But I just wanted people to know that my family is important because I think chefs get lost a lot of times in the restaurant and it's it, it is a challenge for any work, you know, busy work life um, balance. But, um, but yeah, my family's important. I really do try to keep that work life balance. And um, so far, I've been <laughs> successful. <laughs> now I'm, I'm having growing pains. <laughs> I need more seating. Some nights we turn away people. So I, I think that I'm really fortunate. It almost feels like it was it was hard, but it was easier to um, come into it, pandemic, really small, and slowly grow my way up. Um, I actually wonder sometimes if it was a part of my success, um, because sometimes when we open, you know, the way that we want to open, it it might not work out the way that we think. You know, if I had opened full blown and put bison tartare on the menu right out, right on the get go, I don't know that I had a good enough reputation for that right away. Whereas the pandemic put me 
you know, it knocked me down a few notches and it made me start out different and smaller and more approachable. And then I slowly realized, I realized that I needed to slowly grow into what I actually wanted. And I, and I think the pandemic actually helped me do that and, and slowly grow to where I wanted to be. And I'm still not quite there. I'm really close, <laughs> but I, I actually think it, it could have been um, part of my success. We also, during the pandemic, another thing that we started was uh, like a little market inside. And that's kind of where bread baking came in. I wasn't necessarily planning on baking a lot of bread, but that market thing has become kind of its own thing. And we try to carry other Minnesota products, you know, other local products. Um, so I would like to see that expanded a little bit as well. It's kind of become a symbiotic relationship there and we have just barely enough room for both. <laughs> and I am on a, I think I've got another, Hmm, 13 to 15 years left in the restaurant business. And then I have another plan. I just would like to see it expand. I love teaching people. That's one thing that, that I, I do for my staff. I want to provide them learning opportunities. We have a lot of those in the kitchen just working with different ingredients or different ways of preparing things. We also go to farms. But I just, I just wanna see growth. Uh, I want to see people happy eating food. I mean, that's just, that's my goal, really, just to bring really good food to people and have them be happy when they leave. <laughs> Maybe somebody will take it over someday. I mean, I, I wouldn't mind that, whether it's one of my children or, you know, somebody who's really, really interested in, you know, owning their own restaurant and they want to take it over. I'm not opposed to that. Building a Table for Seven was made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund.